This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Um, so yes, we're going to talk about the neuroscience of increasing website conversions. And uh, just a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Stratabeat, which is marketing, branding, and uh, uh, and design agency. We work exclusively in WordPress, uh, so building websites, uh, microsites, landing pages. Uh, throughout my career, I've worked with everyone from startups to mid-sized companies, a lot of the, the biggest of the big out there. So I've worked with AT&T, Procter & Gamble, uh, Kraft Foods, United Healthcare, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, a lot of the, the Fortune 100. And so uh, I'm going to share a lot of the insights uh, from working with those types of companies with you tonight. and. Um, you know, one thing which I've noticed uh, through the years is that the, the smartest marketers, the ones who are most successful, always tap into neuroscience. They're always thinking about how their audience thinks and why, and why they behave the way they do, why they take the actions the way they do. So they're trying to understand how their audience thinks and getting down as deep as possible. Uh, and so we're, we're going to try and do that uh, together tonight. So what... What is this not? Well, it's, we're not going to talk about how to drive people to your website. We're not talking about traffic generation. We're talking about once you've identified your target audience and you bring them to your website, how can you get them to take the actions that you want them to take? And what's, what's really crazy is that if you look at the vast amount of marketing information that's out there, the majority of it does focus on traffic generation. Uh, and it's not only the content that's out there, but it's the, the actual companies and where they're putting their money. For every $92 spent acquiring website visitors, only $1 is spent to convert them. This is just backwards. It's just, it's just very odd and uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You, you know, think about it. For many websites, if you can just increase your conversion rate by what, 2%, 3%, 4%, you can double your money. And so, these types of investments just don't make a lot of sense. And so, okay, if we know that website conversions are critical, then how do we go about increasing them? Um, the first thing we want to do is understand the power of the subconscious mind and its relationship to people's behavior. And so, if we look at the subconscious mind versus the conscious mind, our brains process 11 million bits of sensory information every second, 11 million. Compare that to the conscious mind, and it's less than 100. And so if our brain is focusing the vast, vast majority of its energy on the subconscious, it just makes sense that we communicate to the subconscious. We're going to be more effective. And if you have something that's very valuable for your audience, it just makes sense to learn how to be more effective in communicating with your audience. And so you might say, okay, well, that, that's, that's all nice, but what does this have to do with business? Well, it has a lot to do with business. 90% of buying decisions are made by the subconscious mind. And so it's not just this warm and fuzzy malarkey of, oh, our, our, our brains are, are processing 11 million bits of sensory information every second. It, this actually translates into sales for you. So if we want to take action, then we have to understand what drives them, right? Your audience, what, what's driving them? What's causing them to take action? There are only two things, really, only two. The first is they want to avoid pain or, or they want to achieve goals. That's it. And so you have to figure out which of those is your website trying to do. Are you removing obstacles for your, for your audience or are you helping people achieve something that they wouldn't be able to achieve otherwise? And, and I don't care what type of product we're talking about, it, this is still very applicable. You could be talking about software that helps lawyers uh, market their business. And you know, lawyers are not marketers, right? They don't know how to do that. So you're actually doing both there, right? You're, you're helping them avoid certain pain, but you're helping them achieve a goal of being able to market where they might not be uh, able to otherwise. Or you might have, I, I don't even care if you're, you're talking about something as, as boring as cement, okay? If, if you're selling to, uh, 
to a, a construction company or a contractor and you have a faster drying cement, then you're helping solve a problem for them. And so you, you'll see as we walk through the different techniques of uh, conversion optimization using neuroscience, um, you, you're either going to be helping people avoid pain or achieve their goals. So the most important thing that you need to keep in mind when you're doing this is you need to evoke an emotive response in your site visitors. You absolutely have to do this. Think about the websites that you build. Think about the websites that you build for your clients. Are they focused on their products? Are they focused on their technology? Are they focused on their process? Are they, they focused on me, me, me? Or are they evoking an emotive response in the audience? All purchase decisions, 100% of purchase decisions, are based on emotions. How do we know this? There have been neuroscience studies. The neuroscientist Antonio Damasio studied people who had damage to the brain, the part of the brain that triggers emotions. So these people could not feel emotions. They couldn't feel emotions. And what did he discover? He discovered they couldn't make decisions. Why? Because they couldn't feel strongly enough about choosing one product versus another, or one service versus another. So put another way, if your website is not evoking an emotive response in your audience when they hit your website, you're making it extremely difficult for their brains to actually hire you or to buy your product. You're handicapping your business. So th there are examples of this, and there are examples of companies that have really mastered the art of evoking emotive responses from their audience. And they're masterful at it, and they make a lot of money doing it. Think about Nike. Think about one of the most successful marketing campaigns in American history. Just do it. So what does that tell you about their product? Right? Are they talking about their shoes? Are they talking about their sneakers? Are they talking about their apparel? Uh-uh. Not at all. All they're doing, all they're doing is evoking an emotive response. That's all they're doing. It's very powerful. During the Olympics, Nike switched up his message, find your greatness. Again, what does this have to do with shoes? What does this have to do with apparel? Absolutely nothing. But it has everything to do with your emotions. Think about Apple. Think different. It has absolutely nothing to do with their technology. Nothing. In fact, prior to Steve Jobs coming back, when they were just focused on talking about their technology, it wasn't successful. They were on the brink of bankruptcy. Think about CompUSA selling computers. And what do they focus on? They focus on price, right? 10% off, 20% off, 10% off, 20% off. That, that was their entire marketing message, right? Doesn't really evoke an emotive response out of anyone, right? But think different. That's all about emotions, 100%. Very, very successful. CompUSA went bankrupt. Apple is now one of the most valuable companies on the market. So we're talking about a lot of positivity, but it's, it's not all about making people happy or excited or aspirational in that sense. You have to figure out what works for your audience. So for instance, uh, I worked with Brink Security. Uh, they're, they're now part of ADT. And it, it was really interesting because you would think, well, they sell home security systems, so we probably want to communicate a message of peace of mind, right? Buy the home security system, have peace of mind. But actually, what, what was much more powerful in their marketing was focusing on fear and making sure that, that people understood that, that there was something to be fearful about. And we're not talking, when we talk about neuromarketing and neurosis, we're not talking about manipulation. We're not. <clears throat> What we're talking about is if you have something valuable for a certain audience segment, and it's truly valuable, how can you communicate that value more effectively so that it truly resonates on a deeper level? And with Brinks, if you heard the stories of, of how their security systems have saved lives, um, and really just, just stuff that would bring anyone to tears, um, it, it's, 
it's something that you do want to convey to more and more people. And so again, with neuroscience, with neuromarketing, we're not talking about manipulation. We're just talking about figuring out what are the emotional triggers so that you can more effectively communicate, evoke the proper emotive response so that they understand what your value is. Now, sometimes it's interesting. Uh, you, you never know what it is that's going to change the emotive response in the audience. And so um, this is Hawk Hosting, a web hosting company. Uh, and on their homepage, they were testing four different variants of their web copy. And they were testing four different variants of the icon that they were displaying on the page. And the one on the left is the control with the globe. And the one on the right was the eventual winner. And the one on the right actually increased conversions by two to three times. That's massive. Doubling and tripling conversions. Um, the company won't, won't be more specific than that with their numbers. Um, but what's interesting here is that they had four variants of language, yet, I don't know if you can see, but the language is identical in the control versus the winner. The only, the only difference was the icon. And think about it, a globe. How does that make you react? Does it make you react emotionally in any way? Probably not. We see globes everywhere in marketing, everywhere. Probably some of your clients use globes in their websites. It's very, very common. But it doesn't evoke an emotive response. So they put the padlock in and all of a sudden their conversions skyrocket. The feeling of security. It's a feeling. It's a feeling of security. And so you never know what's going to work. You have to test and test and test some more. And sometimes it's going to be the language, sometimes it's going to be the visual, sometimes it's going to be a combination, sometimes it's going to be your entire, uh, your entire marketing message. But remember, the most important thing that, that I'd love for you to walk away with tonight is focus on evoking an emotive response out of your audience. When they hit your website, make sure they're feeling something. Because if they're not, it's extremely difficult. You're making it extremely difficult for them to convert. Okay, so how do we get them to convert? We know we want them to respond. How do we get them to convert? The first thing is we have to make it visual. So why is it so important to make it visual? Think about this. 46.1% of people say a website's design is the number one criterion. Number one criterion for just discerning the credibility of the company. That means almost half of your website visitors are determining whether you're credible or not, whether you have the right to sell your services or your products to them just by your design. So in other words, if your design isn't sufficient, they're going to dismiss you out of hand very quickly. And then this has been backed up in different industries with different studies. Uh, LexisNexis did one for, for the legal industry. Um, the, one of the reasons for this is that the human brain processes visuals 60,000 times faster than text. So think about that. If you have the opportunity to communicate with your target audience, your prospective clients, wouldn't you want to make it easier for them to understand what you're, what you're conveying, what you want them to remember? And so if that's the case, it's a no-brainer. Make it visual. So review your websites and see how text-heavy they are. Um, and if you are conveying your message through text, test out different visuals instead to convey the same information. Your message might be great, but you might be conveying it in a way that makes the, it very, very difficult for the human brain to process. That's what we're talking about here. It's difficult for the human brain to process text. It's much easier for the human brain to process visuals. It's not only about processing information, it's about remembering information. And our brains are set up to remember things that are visual. And it's, our brains are not set up to remember text, just not. So after 72 hours, website visitors are probably going to remember about 10% of the text that they read while on your website. They're going to remember 65% of the images they saw. And they're going to remember 90% of the videos that they watched. So think about that. And is your website, or are your client's website, a bit too text-heavy right now? So talking about visuals, another thing that we want to 
look at, look at and test is what exactly are the visuals that you're showing? So there's a special part of the brain uh, that recognizes faces. It's called the fusiform face area, okay, the FFA. And so we have a part of the brain. Its only responsibility is to recognize faces. Our brain loves looking at faces, loves it. And so what you need to do with your websites is determine what you're going to show people. Are you going to show product or are you going to show faces? And there's no right or wrong answer. You have to test. But if you think that showing your product is the right thing to do, you may be wrong. You may be able to convert many more people if you're focusing more on showing faces. Um, and this has been proven over and over again. You look at very successful organizations. Let, let's take a, a look at Feeding America. Uh, I believe that they are the largest organization in this country focused on feeding the hungry. And what do they do? do? Do they show stats when you first land on their page? Nope. Do they show food? Nope. Do they show any bleak imagery? Nope. What they're showing is faces. All sorts of faces. So this is just at the top of the homepage. You would think that this is a slider that goes through about five or six different images and they're all faces, all of them, 100%. Why do they do that? Because that's what works. Showing faces is very, very effective because we have a part of our brain specifically geared towards faces. Now, color is another area. We're talking about making things visual, right? Color is very, very important. And the consistent use of color is very important. Color increases brand recognition by a whopping 80%. 80%, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. So if I said to you, okay, what brand is green? You're probably gonna say Starbucks, or at least many of you would. Um, Starbucks is always, 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 always green, always. Very, very consistent. It's very powerful, very powerful. Now you might sell the same exact product and be a different color. Orange and pink, Dunkin' Donuts. Again, very, very powerful, just a different color set, but they're 100% consistent as well. And so what I've heard is for smaller or mid-tier companies that, well, you know, branding is not as important because a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts has a huge advertising budget. That doesn't make any sense. If you look at how the brain operates and making things easy for people to buy from you, making it easier for them to remember what you're communicating to them, then you are going to be 100% consistent with your color. So another area of neuroscience which is really interesting with websites is the power of mirror neurons. And there was a, there was a group in Parma, Italy, um, and they, they were studying monkeys, and they, they, they put all these notes on the monkeys' heads, and, and they were studying the, the, the brain patterns, the, the neural patterns of the monkeys, uh, trying to learn as much as possible about how, they, how their brains worked and how they thought uh, and why they behaved the way that they behaved. And one day, a grad student as part of the, the uh, study team walked into the room with an ice cream cone, and the monkeys went berserk! And he said, like, wow, that, that's interesting. And sure, that, I mean, that's interesting, but, you know, you might say, well, sure, an ice cream cone might, yeah, you know, that, that's, uh, that, that would trigger anyone's brain to, to, to go off. But what was really interesting about this is that the exact neural signals that were coming out of the, the monkey's brain were identical, identical, as if the monkey was eating the ice cream itself. In other words, there was zero difference in the brain, in the signals coming from the brain, from a monkey watching you eat ice cream versus the monkey eating ice cream itself. And so what does this tell us? Well, this tells us a lot about how to communicate with people. It, what it says is that showing is much, much more effective than telling. And so with your website, instead of trying to tell people how great a product is, how great a service is, uh, how great a team is, how great a technology is, show them. You need to show them to, to trigger the mirror neurons. If you're just telling them, you're not going to be triggering 
the mirror neurons. And so it's much, much more effective. Stories are very, very effective. If you can show people what they can be, so success stories, for example, very, very powerful. Um, customer profiles can be powerful if they're packaged correctly and they're made visual. Um, you know, you look at Weight Watchers and a lot of the programs to lose weight, and what do they do? They're, they're firing your, your, your mirror neurons all the time because it's before, after, before, after, before, after. They're showing you what you can be so that your brain is firing these mirror neurons and you're living it. You feel like you've just lost weight just by watching an infomercial, right? <laughs> so it's the same with the website. GoPro is another example. Um, so think of any way that you can make your prospective clients live your products, live your services, live working with you. How can they experience it? So without even buying a camera, we can live using a GoPro camera, right? Because their, their website and their, their online marketing is so experiential, right? Lots and lots of videos. You can live the excitement. So another area of neuroscience which is very effective is surprise. So our brains are hardwired to love surprises. We love surprises. And the more that you can strategize for your website and your navigational funnels through your website to include elements of surprise it can have a very positive effect on, on your uh, conversions. You cannot be boring. If you're boring, you, you, can, you can try and explain to people uh, why they, they should care about you, but if you make it exciting, if you make, again, going back to make them emotional, evoke an emotive response, get them engaged, you're gonna have a much higher success rate and that's why you see companies introducing this element of surprise all the time among very, very successful companies. Look at Red Bull. They're all about surprise. They want to surprise you at every turn. Uh, they never talk about their, their drink. What they do is they, they'll focus on extreme sports or extreme experiences. Uh, they'll, they'll send someone uh, up to outer space and drop them, uh, drop them out of a, a, an aircraft and film it all. And they're constantly challenging you to experience more and more. And they're all about excitement. But it doesn't have to be a brand that lends itself to something so exciting. Uh, Intel, so I, I've worked with uh, Intel's marketing department and I can tell you that their products are so complex, it would be very, very easy for Intel to fall into the trap of boring marketing, right? They have very technical products. They can talk technology all day long. They can bore the pants off of anyone with their technology, but they don't. They're exceptional marketers. Why? Because they're always thinking of how to surprise you, always. For example, e even with their uh, Innovation Everywhere blog, they, you know, they, they can come up with boring innovation topics, right? But what do they do? They come up with topics like, listen to the color of pizza. It's great. It's great. So even something as simple as a blog and blog topics, you can introduce elements of surprise. So another area of neuroscience which is very effective uh, is the principle of reciprocity. So I'll do this for you, and then you do that for me. So a great example of this is HubSpot, where for years and years, they've been offering uh, a free grader. First it was a website grader, then it morphed into a marketing grader. Uh, and if you question the value of something like this, where they're just offering it for free, all you need to do is enter your, uh, your site address and then enter your email address. So really, they're just after your email address. And if you think that this is tried, it's, it's, it's been done, it's old, it doesn't work, the last stats that I've seen from their marketing grader, they had over 4 million users. Over 4 million. And, and that stat is old. I'm sure it's over 5 or 6 million by now. That's insane. That's crazy. And it's just built on this simple, simple principle of I'm going to do this for you, and then you do something for me. Uh, 
Olay was a, um, a brand that I worked with for several years. Uh, they're part of P&G. And it was interesting. They, uh, years ago, they, they launched a site called Olay for You. Um, and what it, what it does is it walks you through uh, questions of, okay, what, what's your skin type? And what are your skin problems? And based on your answers, it keeps adjusting and adjusting and giving you different questions. And finally, it gives you a solution to your personal skin issues. So if you have dry skin, you're gonna get different answers than you, if you have oily skin, for example. Or if you have acne, you're gonna get completely different answers. And what do you think the conversion rate was for this when they introduced this? 83% conversion rate within the first three months. I mean, most websites, if you get an 8% conversion rate, you'd be doing flips. 83%, crazy. But it's all built on this principle. And, and you've seen this everywhere, right? Download a free ebook, download a free white paper, download this, download that. Again, it's all built on this principle because it's just, it's very, very effective. Another area is social proof. And it's very interesting how our brains work. We do feel more comfortable purchasing something if we know that everyone else is doing it. That's just the way our minds work. So... Basecamp is a project management software, um, and you, you look at their homepage, and what are they saying? Last year alone, Basecamp helped over 285,000 companies finish more than 2 million projects. And that's it. Are they talking about their, their, their technology? No. Are they talking about all their features? No. They're just focusing on social proof. That's it. Social proof, nothing else. Why? because our brains respond to this. Our brains respond to this a hell of a lot more than learning about a feature. And so sometimes you have to kind of transform your marketing, flip it on its head, and forget about what you're selling, and just focus on how our minds work and how can you communicate more effectively so that people get it and they, they'll pay attention and they'll click to the next page. Now, how can Basecamp do it even better? Right, that, that, this was pretty effective, right? How could they do it even better? Well, they did. So here's a landing page that they have that dynamically changes every single week. Just last week, 5,776 companies signed up for Basecamp. So what are they doing? They're being specific. They're, this is very, very trustworthy, right? Because they're being so specific, how could they be lying? 5,776, they can't be lying, they can't. If I said two million, yeah, you'd be like, oh, he, you know, maybe they're rounding up. You can't lie with these types of numbers. At least that's the way our minds think. That's how, we, that's how our brains operate. So um, another very powerful form of social proof is if you can have someone who people admire associated with your brand. Very, very powerful. Here we have Oprah. But you don't need Oprah. You don't. Uh, it could be someone who is well-known in your specific industry and just as well-respected in your industry. Uh, if you're a local restaurant, it could be the mayor uh, of the town. Uh, so it's going to be different for every, every company, and you don't need to get some, uh, a celebrity as big as Oprah. You, you know, it can, be, it can be anyone, anyone who is well-respected. Consumers trust social reviews 12 times more than manufacturers' descriptions. So, again, people, people trust other people. They trust other consumers. How can you introduce more reviews, more social proof, rather than telling people more about what you do, telling people more about your services or your products? Uh, Kaya Skin Clinic uh, ran some tests. And uh, what they were looking to test was different messaging in combination with social proof and seeing what would happen. And so uh, this is a promotion for a skin consultation. And the language here, if you can't see it, is for skin consultation register here. And then they test it against, I want an expert opinion, sign me up. And then they test that against social proof. So here they're including how many people like their Facebook page. 
So it's not, it's not even social proof of this specific offer, right? It doesn't even matter. What matters is just the fact that this many people have said that we're credible, that we're valuable. Uh, and therefore, a lot of people just automatically will assume that, yeah, they are credible. They are valuable. So how did this increase conversions? There's a 137.5% increase in the conversion rate, and the social proof was responsible for 70% of that. So very, very powerful. Social proof, I've seen social proof um, in action. Uh, years ago, I worked in an agency, and Constant Contact was the client. Um, they're, they're a large software company in Massachusetts. They started out with email marketing software, morphed into social media and event management software. So, so essentially, it's marketing software. And um, years ago, they ran different tests uh, on their, their, uh, their uh, paid search advertising, so their PPC ads. And what they were doing was they, they were seeing what resonated with their audience. And they're marketing software, so you would think an ROI type of business-focused message would be the most effective thing that they could do, right? Use our software, make more money. Use our software, get more leads, right? Well, they tested it against an ad that simply said, over 200,000 small businesses use our software. Guess which one? The social proof overwhelmingly won. So much so that they used that messaging front and center on their homepage for years, for years. So that it escalated, not only from 200,000 businesses, but to 300,000 businesses and onwards. So what they did was they used PPC advertising to figure out how their audience was thinking, the types of messaging that their audience responded to, and then they applied it to their website and to every other form of marketing that they did. So it's very, very powerful. Um, and and it's, it's not really surprising that social proof is that powerful. So finally, what you want to do is you want to take all of this, right, and, and you want to test it out because a lot of this sounds great, but until you start testing, you don't know exactly what's going to work for you and your clients most effectively. Um, you really have to test, but there are a lot of tools out there to help you. Um, the one that I, I personally have the most experience with is Unbounce. Uh, it's, it's fantastic, very, very easy to use. Uh, and it enables you to set up very, very easily a lot of A-B tests to figure out whether this works better than that or that works better than this. Uh, Optimizely is very similar to Unbounce. Uh, Visual Website Optimizer, very similar. Uh, Nelio A-B tester is uh, something that I haven't used, but I'm very eager to start testing it out. It is WordPress specific, uh, and they claim that, that they are the most comprehensive A-B testing solution for WordPress. Uh, and so, again, I, I haven't used it, but it looks fantastic. Uh, I'm e eager to get started with it. Um, and also, Kingsumo is another one that you might want to test out. Kingsumo is also WordPress specific. Uh, and what it does is it, it tests out blog titles. Uh, and so, if you're looking to increase your blog readership, if, you, if you're looking to um, get more signups in your blog, uh, more click throughs on your headlines, it's a fantastic tool. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but for if you have a blog, probably, probably 80% uh, of the people who see your blog titles stop there, and only 20% click through to actually read your blog posts, 20%. And so you need to do everything possible to figure out, well, what is it that that, that is going to get my audience to respond positively, to, to feel compelled to click. And so what King Sumo does is it, it makes it super easy for you to, uh, to display four, five, six different blog titles. And obviously it, it, it displays uh, based on different uh, user sessions, um, but it's a very fast way for you to figure out what is working well, what's not, so you can drop the losers and you can just keep the winner. And so, again, I, I'd encourage you just to keep testing and testing and testing because regardless of anything I said tonight, it, you're not going to know what works most effectively for your specific clients and for each specific client until you start testing. 
So thank you very much. Any questions? Yep. Yeah, um, I've been working with a small business, a startup that's basically one product company, and there have been many, many um, discussions, arguments, whatever you want to call them, yep. about displaying video on their homepage. And okay. whether it should autoplay or it should be initiated by the user. Is, is there a general rule of thumb about this? I've heard you should not do that, and I hate it when sites do that, but other people may respond differently. Is this a background video, or is this, say, like a, a YouTube video that's front it's and center? More of a YouTube-ish kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't do autoplay. Uh, well, and, and it also depends where they're, where the audience is likely to be. If it's a business audience, you never, ever want to do autoplay. Because people are at, at work. They can't have sound on their laptops or their desktops going. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I would say if, it, if it's a business audience, definitely not. It's a consumer product. It's a consumer product? Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could test. You could test both ways and see what happens. Uh, and you can test with a video and without a video. We've done tests of videos versus images, and you would think that a video would win every time. It doesn't. In the tests yeah, test that we've done, images have won. Uh, and it could be just those specific tests, but you never, ever know. You never know until you test it. And it could be that people don't have the time. For that type of product, they don't have the time. They're not going to take the time to watch a video. They, they, an image is good enough. It gives them the information they need to convert, whereas a video might just be too cumbersome because they, they don't want to spend the time and they feel like they have to, so they go somewhere else. So you just have to test it to see what works. Um, when uh, Obama was running for president, he did similar tests, video versus um, uh, image. Image blew away video, so you never know. Tom, a friend of mine set up a website that was construction debris Bags. Okay. Yep. Yep. You fill them up with like a thousand pounds, and he had pretty good success in traffic. But then they changed the color of this bag to be the same as Home Depot's color, the orange. Okay. So I was thinking that when you talked about Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, yep, that increased his his business. Uh, I don't know if Depot will figure it out and come back on him. I don't know if he could register a, a color. Yeah, I, I, I'm, never, I'm never a fan of trying to do business that way. Uh, I'm, you, you should build your own brand. Uh, and just trying to copy what others are doing or take advantage of others. Or probably what's happening is there, there's confusion in the market. If sales spiked after the color change and, and it looks identical to uh, Home Depot's, then there might be some confusion. Certain people are thinking that it is the Home Depot product. You never, yeah, and you never want to do business that way. At least I, I, I would recommend never doing business that way. Um, you know, you want to be honest. You want to have a lot of integrity. You want to build your own brand and a strong brand uh, and a differentiated brand. If there's, if there's confusion in the market as to what the brand is and is that Home Depot, then, you know, how are you building a brand? You're not building a brand in that case. You're just stealing revenue very, very short term. And then what are you going to do in three years? What are you going to do in four years? So, you know, people might have different opinions on that, but um, I, I would always advise companies, build your own brand. Don't try and steal revenue from others. Thanks for the uh, fascinating presentation. Sure. Um, you talked about President Obama. And where, can you give us any other thoughts about using the personal branding for <coughs> Yeah, very, very powerful and very effective to bring in the personal. So LexisNexis did a website conversion study. I th they, they do it every two years. The last one was 2013. And what they found was, yeah, personal profiles of the lawyers does impact conversions positively. But by having very solid, uh, well-thought-out visual uh, profiles, it does help with conversions. Uh, people want to know who they're doing business with. They want to trust them. Oh, yeah, we're huge, huge believers in testing. We test everything. 
everything. Whatever we do, we test. Uh, it's, I can't remember the last time we launched a campaign where we weren't testing something. And so the balance of visual versus text, uh, you, you have to test it. You have to test and see what works and what doesn't, and the data will be very honest with you. Uh, you know, I, I might have a theory as to what works, and I might be totally wrong, but your testing won't be wrong. Your testing will be very accurate, and it will tell you exactly what that specific target audience wants and, and what they respond to, what resonates with them. Uh, sometimes it'll, sometimes you can use text as a visual. Um, and so, you know, you can play around with very clever language, make it huge, and sometimes that's very effective. Uh, and so you just have to test different things. But it is true that the brain processes visuals 60,000 times faster than text. And so you do want to have some type of visual elements in your marketing to make it easier for your target audience to process what you're trying to communicate. So what exactly does your company do, Tom? I mean, it's very interesting, all this stuff you present from, especially the 80% uh, decision making by the subconscious. I mean, I thought only Salvador Dali was privy to these kind of uh, <laughs> insights. But what do you, so what do you guys do for a company? Do you design a testing program? Do you choose a provider? Do you think of the content? I mean, what? So we, we do um, everything from the branding to the design and the development of websites and uh, a branding identity, look and feel, logos, identity packages, things like that, microsites, landing pages, advertising, uh, marketing collateral, whatever it might happen to be. And so the most important thing that we find is you need to come up with the right marketing strategy first. Because you can do a lot of marketing tactics, and if you have your strategy off, if, if it's off and it's not differentiated and it's not, if it doesn't resonate powerfully, if, it, if it's not identifying, say, some white space in your market, you can do this type of marketing all day long and it's not going to be nearly as effective as if you got your marketing strategy correct. So a lot of what we do is we'll spend a lot of time up front in building the marketing strategy. Once we've nailed down the marketing strategy, that's when we'll start implementing these types of things, whether it's in the design um, or if, if we're talking about landing pages, well, of course we'll be testing. If you're talking about email campaigns, A-B testing of the, of the emails uh, on the website, you want to be A-B testing, different language um, with your blog. Uh, titles you, you want to be uh, a B testing those and so a lot of it is 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 the strategy development that we do but then also the execution of all the ongoing testing how do you take the variables out of this I mean you, you might think Monday morning is a good time to launch mm -hmm. but after the Super Bowl it may not get the traffic to a certain product. yeah yeah so uh, one, one so, okay, here's the key thing with A-B testing. We run into this a lot. A lot of companies want to do sequential testing, and we always advise against it. The reason is exactly what you're saying. You are introducing so many new variables and variables that you could never know if you're doing sequential testing. And so what you have to do is concurrent testing. So that's what A-B testing is. If you're using any of the, the software products, which, which I listed here, that is concurrent testing. You're testing A against B at the same time, and that's critical, because you're absolutely right. I, I was talking with um, uh, a shoe brand uh, the other day where what they wanted to do was sequential testing, and I brought up the fact that, well, it's very seasonal, and so your data is going to be completely skewed month to month, right? Whereas if you're testing the same exact offer, just say with different messaging or different visuals or different calls to action or a different offer altogether, it has to be at the same time because otherwise seasonality is going to throw everything out of whack. And, and then you, you, you might draw the wrong conclusion from the data. So it's very, very important to do concurrent testing. Me again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with the testing platforms that you, you cited on one of your slides, yep. there was one that I recently heard about that a lot of people seem to be advocates for called Mojo. They're based locally in Linfield. Okay. And they have a very strong visual editor that it's very easy to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever testing concurrently. Yep. I was just wondering if you'd heard anything about them or 
I haven't. They might be fantastic. They might be fantastic, but I haven't heard of them. Um, but be careful. So you mentioned A, B, C, D, E. Well, you know, that's part of their options. Yep. Right. And that's called multivariate testing. So I purposefully called it A, B testing for a reason. So Unbalanced can do a lot of multivariate testing as well. We do not advise most companies to do multivariate testing, even though you can. A lot of these products will let you do multivariate testing. We advise against it. Why? Because unless you are a Hewlett Packard, unless you are an Olay, unless you're a multi-billion dollar brand that is going to be driving tons of traffic, you're not going to have a, a substantial data set to work with if you're doing multivariate testing. It's going to take forever for you to have a, a sufficient data set to make any intelligent decisions. And so for the vast majority of companies, what I say is do A-B testing all day long because you can do it A-B testing, generate quick understanding, move on to the next one, move on to the next one, move on. We're not saying do an A-B test and then stop. We're saying do an A-B test, then launch another one, then launch another one. So you keep picking a winner and then you keep doing another A-B test rather than an A-B-C-D-E test, which you can do. You technically, it's very easy to do. We advise against it though. What kind of statistical significance does, you know, creates real meaning? Like how many, when you do the A-B testing, what do you... Yeah, it's going to be different for every company, but I, I would say, uh, and it also depends on the, uh, on the, uh, the volume of conversions. That you expect, yeah, you know, if you're if you're selling something that costs five thousand dollars, that's a lot different than selling something that costs fifty dollars, and so all of that comes into play. Um, but I, I would say if you don't have at least a thousand or a few thousand um, in traffic for every variant of your test, it's way way too low. You you, you can't make any intelligent decisions. Okay, thank you.